We now move on to the uh, ten-minute rule motion. Tom Hunt. Madam Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill to make provision for a statutory code of practice to set standards for cladding remediation works in occupied buildings and for connected purposes. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, there has rightly been a lot of focus in this place uh, and also across the country on um, the need to make high buildings, in particular high-rise buildings, safe. Um, next month is the six-year anniversary of the Grenfell tragedy, uh, and, and everyone in this House would remember every single person who lost their life in that tragedy. Yeah, yeah. And it is right that there has been a huge focus in the aftermath of that on making sure that buildings are safe. It's got a lot of attention. And there's been many cases in Ipswich where we've had buildings that weren't safe, that have been made safe and are currently being in the process of being made safe. And it's also right, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that some attention has been paid to how we pay for these works and ensuring that leaseholders do not pay. is something that I've spoken about uh, many times before, uh, and I welcome the passing of the Fire, um, the Fire Safety Act and the Building Safety Act as well. But what's got slightly less attention, Madam Deputy Speaker, is how these works are carried out. In Ipswich, we have a num number of examples of uh, cloud and remediation works taking place. We have one key example where there has been no respect for the residents that are expected to live and continue to live inside of those buildings as the works are taking place. Um, I've spoken to uh, uh, the Minister here before about the case of St Francis Tower in, in, in the heart of my constituency that has quite frankly become a scar on the landscape. It is a constant reminder when my constituents look at that building but couldn't be more visible across the town. They think about the lives of those who have been expected to live inside of that building. When the shrink wrap initially went on, uh, St Francis Tower, it was expected the work would take eight months. Now, here we are, and it's been almost two years, and despite repeated emails and letters from me to the agent, I can't get an answer. I can't get a timescale in terms of when that shrink wrap's going to come up. Uh, and let's, let's be clear about what this shrink wrap is. It completely blocks out all natural light. Mm. A large number of my constituents for over two years have been expected to believe, live in conditions that I would feel guilty having animals live in. Mm. No natural light, not breathable material, terrible communications from the agent, timescales were repeatedly missed with no explanation or justification, and even to this point, I have hundreds of my constituents looking towards a summer where they think it, that there's going to be no end, no end point. In addition to the, the main shrink map, recently we've had a blue film, which has actually prevented many of the windows from being opened. I've had constituents say that they can't even cook because of poor <coughs> ventilation. I had one uh, constituent, I've been inside of the tower three times myself, and I went inside of there. But these, 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 these flats, they're small, they don't have any balconies, they have no outdoor space. And I remember talking to one constituent, and she said she used to drive great joy from having some plants on her windowsill which were all dying because of the fact that there was no natural light allowed in because of this shrink wrap. So I believe that I've done everything I can to try and get block management through the managing agent, RG Securities who are a freeholder, and Oanda um, and Gilmore who are the contractors um, who have failed in their duty to stand up for residents. Great, thank you. Um, we have some other examples in, in Ipswich where, and I think actually, and, and you know, naively I thought, naively I thought, when I, went in, when, I, when I went inside St Francis Tower, I couldn't believe it was legal. I couldn't believe that in today's society it was allowed to happen. Mm. When um, one of your predecessors um, um, visited the, the, the Tower Block, he said it was one of the worst, most shocking examples he'd ever seen. Um, so w what is this about? What is this code of practice about? It's trying to make sure what's happened at St Francis Tower never happens again anywhere else. We have some better examples in, in Ipswich, if there's some better examples in Ipswich with, with other buildings where the material used has been slightly better than the material used at St Francis Tower. Or well key, for example, we have more of a netting material, mm. which is better at letting natural light in, it's more breathable, and actually also the companies involved have been much more responsible. Mm. But the fact, sadly, sadly, the fact of the matter is, and I thought by all the, the high profile campaigning the local newspaper did, and that I was doing, but actually, that in itself would pressure the companies involved to act with more corporate responsibility mm. and social responsibility. I was naive. I was wrong. So now is a time, Madam Deputy Speaker, where we have to bring in a code of practice 
to ensure that these rogue freeholders and rogue agents are held to account for behaving in a way that has had a detrimental and shocking impact on the quality of lives of my constituents, who I stand here today to represent forcefully, as forcefully as I need to. Yeah. I have spoken before um, with, with the Minister, and, I've also, and I understand that there is a, um, a code of practice uh, that is likely to come forward. But it is absolutely, absolutely vital, vital, that this code of practice has teeth. It cannot be dismissed as a flimsy document. And, and that is why I do believe it needs to be legally binding. I do believe that if we do have cases of building agents, freeholders, contractors disregarding this code of practice, then they should be held account. There should be penalties. What sort of things should this code of practice cover? It should cover, it should cover the type of material used. I think that is absolutely vital that the Code of Practice does that. And by that, we have to look at materials that, yes, I understand, you know, when, when, when these works take place and the cladding is removed, there needs to be some kind of covering to protect the structural integrity of the building. I understand that. But is it not beyond the wit of man to come up with a solution that does that, but doesn't have such a shockingly detrimental impact upon the people expected to live in those buildings? It's also important that certain standards are set in terms of the level of communication expected with residents expected to live in those buildings, giving them enough notice to plan, mm. giving them the ability to relocate if it is felt that the works will be too detrimental on um, the standards of living of those expected to live in those buildings. Also, points about ventilation, about timescales, and also when timescales are repeatedly missed, there's some kind of sanction for that. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, since I was first elected uh, as a Member of Parliament for Ipswich, cladding issues have, have been a key, key issue for me. They've been a key issue for me. The Minister will know about the situation of Cardinal Loss. He'll know about the situation there, where I've had uh, constituents, uh, because of poor ventilation, who have been relocated, and even now they're in temporary accommodation, but sometimes only for three or four months. They don't know what's going to happen at the end of that three or four month period. Shocker. So there's a number of issues associated with Cardinal Loss. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, this issue specifically focuses on an issue that I predict will affect many honourable friends and honourable members in their constituencies. There will be examples in constituencies across the country. As it happens, St Francis Tower is one of the first beneficiaries of the Building Safety Fund. Good. The building is being made safe. Good. We understand that. We welcome that. And actually, I think most of my constituents in those buildings expect a level of, a, a, you know, a, a, an acceptable level of disruption. What has happened at St Francis Tower... And I look at it every day, and I hold myself partly responsible that I haven't been able to get that removed. Mm. And I'll be honest about that. But we are here now. I welcome the fact that a code of practice has been discussed. But please, let's make sure, and that is why this bill is necessary, to make sure that it's not a flimsy document, to make sure that these um, companies that behave in a morally responsible way are held to account. Um, so I, I hope... I hope that this 10-minute um, this, this, uh, rule bill um, will get the support of the House and everyone in this place and that we can have a second reading. And that, but one way or another, though, the key thing for me, <coughs> this bill, not this bill, one way or another, we've got to get the safeguards in place to make sure that there are no more St Francis Towers ever again. It is made illegal and those responsible held to account. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Elliot Colborne, Stephen McPartland, Royston Smith, Sir Peter Bottomley, Mark Menzies, Sir John Hayes, Paul Bristow, Dr Dan Poulter, Miriam Cates, Lee Anderson, Danny Kruger and myself, Madam Speaker. Tom Hunt.
Plaid and Remediation Works Code of Practice Bill. Second reading, what day? Friday the 24th of November. Friday the 24th of November. 